Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. Uh, today, I'm here with Pete and Mark, and we're going to chat about some of the most exciting, cool things we learned in 2022. So thanks for being here, gents. Thank you for having us. Need to be here. <laughs> I love that I just keep treating you like guests when at this point you're more like <laughs> furniture. You know, like you're yes. really just yes. here on a regular basis. We're going to keep pretending I, like it's brand new I, every time. Do identify as furniture, so that's I appreciate <laughs> perceptive of you to observe that. What kind specifically, Fisher? A chaise lounge, Pete. A chaise lounge. Wow. Beautiful. Kind of classy, but also casual. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, functional. Fit to drink a martini on. <laughs> or, or faint. Aren't they also like yes. kind of fainting couches? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All the fainting yes. you do, that makes yes. sense. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. This podcast is off to a great start, but um, as I mentioned, dear listeners, we thought since this is coming, this podcast is getting released towards the end of this year of 2022, we thought we'd just have a moment to be reflective with you all and think back to something we did this year. And each of us will share one thing we did this year that we really are proud of, maybe that we learned from, something we figured out, something that became clear to us. There's really, it's a broad, it's a broad net we're casting here, but we're going to go kind of one at a time and share. We haven't heard each other's yet. So we're going to be hearing this from each other for the first time as we do this, but something we learned or experienced that taught us something this year that we thought we should share with all of you. Um, I'm going to take volunteers today. Who wants to go first? I'll go. Uh, Fisher. Wow, right. Fisher, beat you to it. Got you. Yeah. Go ahead, Fisher. Tell us about yours. I think a big win for this year was the development and high functioning of MFF's leadership team. So a little bit unusual compared to a lot of gyms. We have three people that essentially have leadership roles. So anyone that has heard me talk about this either in emails or at events or on video, most training gyms benefit from having what I call a sous chef or the hand of the king, a really right hand position that could be a general manager or assistant general manager, depending on how you've run it. And the thing about it is having that position in your gym is incredibly important because it gives you a thought partner, which allows you to do better strategic thinking. It gives you someone that gives you the ability to take time off and know that there's somebody that can help unclog a toilet if need be. And of course, you're willing to do the same for this person. It also gives an opportunity for some of your organization to make more income, to grow and develop professionally and not be, quote unquote, just a frontline worker. So that is an amazing thing if you get it right. And it can be challenging to get it right because you both need to really pick the right person that is wired to do that kind of role. And importantly, the thing that I feel like at this point, I've finally developed some acme on to do consistently across a wide variety of personality types. You need to develop the structures that allow you to develop the individual over time to keep them accountable, to make sure they're getting enough love and care and water and sunlight and all the things that are required when you're gardening a human being. And as I mentioned, MFF, it's unusual because we have three, though the same principles will apply to you that they do to me. And we have a, a fitness director, a sales director, and an operations manager. And for context, our sales director is the most senior person in her role. And she started, I think, in August of last year. The operations director started officially, I believe, in December of last year. So this is basically his first year. And the fitness director has only been in his position since mid-April, May. So it's a relatively junior, to some extent, leadership team. And I have to say the big win has been, I'm very, very proud of their work. I think they're all doing excellent and really dialed into their particular roles and responsibilities. They're all really showing up from an education perspective and really investing in developing skill sets, the things that they need to understand for their role in the business and to be in the fitness industry at large. And that has been a massive win. If I were to share briefly, your takeaway of what the what I would consider to be the primary tool of developing this individual, which is maybe obvious, but is good weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. Mm -hmm. Again, plug, if you go to markfisheryoutube.com, you can find there's a video where I break down my particular system. But if you don't have a regular dedicated pulse, you're not really going to be developing individuals. Now, part of this, maybe the final thing I'll share that's been interesting, just an observation is I think also if I've, as I've gotten older, I have become more willing and confident to take an explicit mentor relationship with the individuals that I am managing, which means that on a regular basis, both in our full team leadership meetings 
end in these meetings, they actually become a training session where we would do role plays. I will teach them frameworks. I will do pop quizzes with them and drill them on certain heuristics that we use when we're managing and leading other people. And at any rate, it's been a very satisfying, fulfilling time. So if you're interested in learning more about that, if you go to my YouTube page, you can find that video there. Uh, and the other thing that, uh, I swear, this is the last thing I'll mention I think that is important is the other thing that I'm finally doing with them, which in retrospect, I'm an idiot, but I didn't do more before, was not just training them at their job, but training them how to be managers and leaders and mm -hmm. constantly checking in on how is your team doing? What can I do to support you more to support them? How are they feeling? Are there any issues you're finding with your team's performance? Do you want to role play this challenging conversation you're going into, right? And I think in the past, impossibly stupidly, I mostly took that for granted. I think I started taking that very seriously, unfortunately, in 2020 and the world ended. But so that's my win and some potential takeaways. Yeah. Let me see if I can recap some of that, Fisher. Thank you. I think it was really, really great. Is the takeaway is leadership team is crushing it. Feel like they're firing all cylinders. The two takeaways for our dear listeners, if they want to follow in your in your footsteps here, is one, have great one on one meetings with with your the people you manage. And in those meetings, focus on them doing their job and focus also on their skill set development for them becoming better managers and leaders. Um, yes. I think that's and and go to Fisher's YouTube page to find out more about the exact system that he uses in those one on ones. Yeah. Did yeah, I miss anything? Totally. Nope. That's great. Yeah. There's some yeah. other beats in there that I think will be helpful, but I'll let you go to the YouTube page to find them because I do think you just want to structure those meetings well. And then you want to be show pig headed, stubborn discipline and has to happen every time, every time, every time. Yeah, I think that's it. Too often I talk to people, even in our unicorn society, um, that you know that they they're pretty good about meeting sometimes with the people they manage, right, right, right. but it's not consistent, and there's no agenda, and so that yeah. consistency of showing up is the consistent messaging that teaches people how to behave around here. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're modeling the very important thing. Yes, yeah, you're modeling. This is what we do. This is how how I manage you. Is hopefully how you're going to manage the people you manage, um, and yes. there's that you know that that ripple effect. So yeah, I, I love that. I also, yeah, I keep going, but I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for sure. Uh, what about you, Pete? All right, I'm going to break the rules. And instead of giving you one answer, I'm going to give you three. Um, oh, I do this uh, yeah, back, when, back when I used to blog more frequently, like period, which I don't do anymore consistently. Uh, I find that sometimes I'd be like, I have this idea, but it's not enough. It's not beefy enough to be a whole post. But I've got these couple here, and I used to do a segment called Gym Owner Musings. And I'd be like, here are three little lessons I learned. And that's the approach I'm going to take here, because I have three ideas that could be the one thing. But they all are kind of micro and have simple takeaways. First, we lost our office manager at the start of August. I didn't want to fast play the hiring process, because I've got burned on that with some mediocre hires in recent years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there are consequences for that, one of them being that I'm replacing my office manager more often than I'd like. And so I decided to slow play it for the last three months. And as a result, I've been putting in a decent percentage of hours out at our front desk over the course of each given week. And it's forced me to overhaul our SOPs and refamiliarize myself with some, quite frankly, shitty systems that needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. And so I got to do that. And I have a new office manager starting in a couple of weeks. And the onboarding process has already started in kind of a slow drip format. And I'm feeling really good about it. And it's been a win. And sometimes I think that we get so good at working on our business and not in it that we forget that some of the systems within it become archaic over time. Yeah. And so I worked in it for the last couple of months. And as much as I'm stressed and tired, we're here, we're a, about a week out from Thanksgiving and next week is going to be the ultimate grind for me because I'm pretty much full-time front desk during the week when all the college kids come back. But on the other <laughs> side is a, is a new hire. Um, that was my first one. Occasionally working in your business is not a bad thing if you've become really good at extricating yourself from it. Second one, yeah. um, right around that same time, we lost a staff or a staff member moved on in a career change format. And we collectively, meaning my coaches on staff, John, my business partner, colleagues and I, we, we collectively agreed to run it lean for the fall and take the upside of the extra non-payroll cash flow and incentivize the non-owner coaches with some kind of performance driven bonuses. And I've been able to give bonuses that I haven't in the past. And as much as we're all hustling, 
they're just they're doing such a good job because they're incentivized in a way that they haven't been in the past and it's wow. it's scaled retention in a way that we have to make that higher now but can still also offer bonuses which is mm -hmm. pretty cool uh so that's lesson number two uh third one i added a business partner this year as i have discussed on the podcast and at retreats and that's just been a massive value add for me because i lost sight of how important it is to have what you guys have which is somebody present to bounce ideas off of and Eric it continues to be my business partner, but the pace that the Florida facility is growing and the pace that his role with the Yankees is growing, it's just been harder and harder for the two of us to find time to think as owners in tandem and having yeah. John join has been a game changer for me. So I would say if you're a single operator and you're wavering on the idea of adding a business partner, I see a lot of pros as much as it's hard to part ways with equity. It's been refreshing. It's added sleep to my schedule. It's made the business more creative. It's a new layer of accountability that I didn't have. So yeah, three takeaways, uh, but they were all good. I guess in summary, I'd say 2022 has been really good in that sense. Good for you. Yeah, those are awesome, Pete. Let me see if I can recap your takeaways. One is if you're a solar operator, do you want a business partner? <laughs> Maybe you should consider that, right? You know, that could be super helpful in, in your development. Um, uh, the, the, the first, uh, the second, the, sorry, the first one you, um, went to was it's, okay, it's helpful to work in your business sometimes getting a new perspective on systems and processes that have been around for a little time, a little while are helpful to catching the stale ones and making updates. Yep. I'm not sure if I recall the takeaway for the middle one, what would you say is the takeaway for our listeners on that? that we ran a lean staff for mm -hmm. the bulk of the past quarter and yeah. it was on their terms though i didn't i Got didn't it. strip away all of their resources and say deal with it i said hey i'm entertaining this idea and it's mm -hmm. going to create a little bit of a buffer which i'm happy to distribute based on how the business performs during that time and it means that some salaried employees have had upside that didn't otherwise exist historically and it's dramatically improved client retention Got it. So I think that the thing I'm taking away from that, um, tell me if you think there's something else is that, um, it's, it can be really valuable to include your staff in making strategic decisions like that about yep. staffing, about pay, about bonuses, like including them in the conversation, especially when there's a hard choice to make like that, um, can be very valuable because they have buy into what comes next. Yes. They have some agency in, in the situation. It's been a good Great. experience. Now, yeah. now teach us, Keeler. What'd you learn? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm gonna give one short one that is actually kind of a mix of personal and professional, but I think will be useful to listeners, which is I think maybe for the first time in my adult life, and now being 43, is that how old I am? In my early 40s, I feel like I finally learned how I like to learn. Right? And that and that's, you know has come at great expense and investment. I, you know, I finished a graduate program this year and started a PhD program this year. And I think it's through all of that different kinds of learning that I finally found a, a, a groove as an adult for how I like to take in and experience new information and frankly, what makes it more sticky for me. And what I've, what I've learned is that I really like structured learning. I like learning that has like a, you know, a beginning, middle and end, like an introduction, a deep dive and some finale. I, I, I also like um, learning that lets me play with the information with other people. Like, you know, reading book is fine for me, but I really only get a lot out of it if I can talk to someone about the book, process each chapter, have dialogue about what I liked and didn't like and what can I can apply and what I can apply. Um, and while all this might sound kind of super obvious, it's like, yeah, of course, Michael, everyone probably learns better the way that it wasn't always obvious to me. Right. I tried lots of different ways of learning from online courses to in person to weekend retreats to, you know, you name it, to books, to ebooks, to audiobooks, to, you know, like I've tried all different kinds uh, of things. And I'm not suggesting the takeaway isn't here that everyone should be in some sort of graduate program. Like that's not it. The takeaway, I think, for listeners from my win here is go find out how you like to learn. <laughs> and that might mean a lot of trial and error, but in my finding, finding this out and discovering kind of the approach that works for me, I enjoy learning more. I'm looking forward to it more. It feels more kind of natural and fun for me. Whereas many times in the last few decades, it felt really forced. I felt like I was doing it because I was supposed to. I felt like I was doing it because 
That's what other entrepreneur friends were doing. Or, you know, oh, Mark reads so much. Mark always talking about how much he loves reading books. I should learn to love read books. And, you know, and he knows because we've had lots of these conversations over the years. That just never landed for me. So I was like, where does that leave me? How does Michael like to learn? Um, and it's through, I think, all of this experimentation and different learning experiences that I'm like, okay, I found a groove for myself. So I think, dear listeners, what I'm suggesting is go explore. If you have not found a way as an adult to keep yourself interested in learning more about the world, learning more about yourself, learning more about your business, I will say even the learning I'm doing now, even though it's not directly related to fitness or running a gym, I think it's re-inspired and reinvigorated my interest in doing the work that we do. Like, I feel like I'm a better coach at Business for Unicorns because I'm more interested in, and certainly I think I'm studying are related to people in the workplace, but I'm not, I'm not, pract I'm not learning about running a gym. <laughs> and it's still it just reinvigorated my interest in talking about and helping people run gyms, right? So like that whole new toolbox has just given me a new perspective on my own work, even though that work hasn't changed. Yeah. Is that all making sense? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Killer, you get me to thinking that maybe academia gets a little bit of a bad rep. And, and the issue is that we encounter it at a stage in life when we're not emotionally mature enough to really appreciate mm -hmm. it, possibly. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I think if I were to go back to graduate school right now, being kind of a voracious reader and somebody who's interested in learning, because I feel like it's on my terms, not because I was at the stage in life where I was told this is when you go chase that thing. Yeah. Um, not everybody gets that privilege. And I realize it's a privilege as well, yeah. because uh, not everybody has that type of flexibility or the means to do it. But you, you're you such a different person now than you were during your yeah. quote unquote college years. 100%. I think both things are true. I think there's plenty to um, to criticize about academia. <laughs> there's plenty that's messed up and broken and <laughs> about it. And I think you're absolutely right that like, you know, even the program I'm in right now, the PhD program I'm in, I haven't talked to either of you about this much, but um, it's full of mid-career professionals. There's no 20 somethings in this program. Everyone's working full time. Many people have families um, and we are all diff very different places than when we went to undergrad <laughs> at 18. Right. And this, you know, I have a different perspective of what I'm interested in, different perspective on um, what I'm curious about in the world, different perspective on how I apply that to my work every day, as I just mentioned. So I 100% think there's there's a lot to the timing with which you discover different learning experiences, and, you know, and, and they're not all created equal. You know, I know plenty of people who were in the program I just finished at Columbia who didn't love it, <laughs> mm -hmm. didn't get a lot out of it. <laughs> I had a great experience. So, right. Um, I think it is highly individualized, which I think takes me back to, I think, what I think my takeaway is for you, dear listeners, is um, if you don't know how you like to learn, go figure that out. Spend a little time. It's so worth the investment. It doesn't have to be formal education, but find some way that you can fall in love with being curious about the world and learning new skills. Sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Any closing thoughts? I mean, we're making this a quick one today, so we'll, we can get out of here ASAP, but any closing thoughts about, about what you learned in 2022? I don't know. I think I've, mm -hmm. I have to say being six weeks left, I feel maybe uh, I need a little more time to reflect on how yeah. this year has gone, but it is... We, uh, yeah. I think we're still, because we're recording this before Thanksgiving, we still have a little bit yeah. of a year left. So it doesn't feel like it's completely in the rear view mirror yet, but I'm sure at the start of the new year in Q1, we'll we'll do another kind of recap or maybe a look forward at 2023. But and maybe I'll, I'll end with this, is uh, listeners, if you don't take the time once in a while to reflect for yourself on what's gone well with your year, what's not gone well with your year, <laughs> what's coming up for yourself, right? I think giving yourself the gift of that time and space to reflect on your life is something we get to do by virtue of having this podcast. <laughs> We're carving out time for reflection on our mistakes and our wins. Um, and it does feel like a real gift that not everyone gets to give themselves. So if you get to give yourself that gift of this holiday period. Um, give it to yourself. <laughs> um, thanks for the great conversation, gents. Uh, appreciate it as always. Listeners, if you like this podcast, give us some five-star reviews wherever you're listening to this podcast. Um, also, uh, let us know what you want us to talk about next. Email us, Michael, Mark, and Pete at businessforunicorns.com are our email addresses. And thanks for a great conversation, gents. I'll see you on the next one. Talk soon, guys. Bye.